All right. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming and joining us on this beautiful afternoon. And thanks for those joining us in here, the power of the internet on Zoom, uh, to take a look uh, at a presentation I like to do a lot. I haven't done it in a while. And I think it's one of, it's one of the first ones we ever did. So it's something that like I really enjoy um, because it's really going to give us a visual on the history of the town. Uh, now it's called Greetings from North Bergen for those in attendance tonight. We have some of the copies uh, on display, but we're going to take a look at some postcards from about, and every time I do it now, like I have to keep doing the math on how long ago it is now. So now we're looking about anywhere from about 124 to 100 and about 15 years ago of what the town would have looked like. So we're looking at postcards from about 1900. Some go into like the 30s, but that's like as far as we're going to go. Um, and I only go into the 30s because, again, there's a ton of postcards online that people always pull up. And it's of some hotel that was on Huntley Avenue. Right. But, uh, you know, we're not going to go down that road. That's a different that's a that's a nighttime event. All right. All right. So let's get started here. Right. This is our event. Greetings from North Bergen. All right. And we will start out. With a very long gone site. OK, uh, and again, last month I did a show downtown, tried to hook up the downtown people. They always get mad. I don't talk about them. None of them showed up. All right. So <laughs> we'll never go back there ever again. All right. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. All right. But what we're looking at here, believe it or not, this this is Kennedy Boulevard. OK, this is the old Asmus estate. OK, it belonged to Ernest Asmus, who was a florist. Now, where this is today, um, believe it or not, you, many of you have passed it, uh, and you've probably passed it a million times. This home would have been located on Kennedy Boulevard, on our side of the boulevard, right? Between 17th and 18th Street, okay? Today, it is, was, well, it's was an apartment complex that was originally built for some World War II veterans, uh, but, the Asmus estate covered everything from present day 14th Street up to about 21st Street. It was a massive piece of property. It contained greenhouses uh, in between Kennedy and Patterson Plank Road. Uh, they were also very influential in the town. They first came into the town in about 1870. Uh, and then Mr. Asmus himself opened up his business and then eventually became mayor. And he was a one term mayor. Um, and he was the last mayor we ever had from downtown North Bergen. All right, and that's my last cheap shot at downtown North Bergen. All right, um, but again, the home stood prominently on Kennedy Boulevard up until the 1920s. So this home really did, it, this was a landmark, right? This really was like the iconic entrance to the town. Uh, and also I'd like to point out here, like most of these postcards, we're gonna see something none of us have ever seen before parking on Kennedy Boulevard. <laughs> okay, remember, these are the years before cars, all right? Now, we'll head a little forward, more north, right? This is going to be, and again, all of these postcards have these just lovely names, Hudson Boulevard dividing West Hoboken, New Jersey, and North Bergen, right? And again, this is Kennedy Boulevard looking south, okay? So today, if you were to go to the intersection of 21st Street and Kennedy Boulevard, believe it or not, these those two homes here, the two connected row homes, are still standing there, right? They're still there. They got white aluminum siding on them now, but they are still there, okay? Uh, we don't know much about any of the residents or anything, but we know the address is two, uh, 2001 Kennedy Boulevard today for those two homes. And again, we can see that the Asmus estate is further back in the in the distance there. And this would have been shown again, just to kind of give people a feel for where they were. All right, now for us, like a postcard, you don't really think of like a random street in some town, right? There's a reason why this is here. And it has to do, if this works or not, Technical difficulties here. I think we might froze. There we go. All right, there we go. Made Chelsea get up. All right, and it has to do with this building. Again, unfortunately, another building which is long gone. 
This is the opposite side of 21st Street and Kennedy Boulevard. Again, on our side, okay? This is the Hudson Boulevard Boulevard. They wrote it twice for some reason. And Plank Road with the Dietz Hotel, Union Hill, West Hoboken, and North Bergen. Now, a building can't be in all three towns at the same time. That's impossible, right? Problem is with postcards, especially for us today when we do these types of presentations and research into postcards, postcards would name everything, right? So in 1905, when this postcard is from, most people would have never heard of North Bergen. It would mean nothing to them. But some people would have known West Hoboken, right? People would have known Union Hill. These are bigger, more populated areas, right? Again, we look at the previous postcard and there's like four houses on Kennedy Boulevard. Okay, you go even further down, there's one house, right? So for this, this is a big deal. This is a huge landmark. The Deets Hotel, okay, is again, at that current intersection across from the Union City Daycare Center building that's down there. Um, it is operated by Conrad Dietz, okay? And <laughs> Conrad, he had a great hookup in town. He had the ability to be the only hotel south of 32nd Street. And the reason he had that ability was because his brother was the mayor of the town. <laughs> so Charles Dietz is the mayor and his brother decides, let's open up a hotel. And they, you know, made no other property available. All right. But the legacy of the Dietz, even though they are both long gone, uh, they have a small dead end street named after them. Uh, right down off of 21st Street. So if you're ever in there, take a turn and you see the last remnants of the Dietz Hotel uh, on Dietz Place, okay? And this is the one most people want to see, right? And this is when, you know, I would teach students about, oh, you know, local history. And I bring up, oh, there used to be amusement parks in these areas. And the kids go, what happened? Um, why did you take them away? And I'm like, uh, OSHA. Um, but, okay, Columbia Park, Right Today, most of us know it as the shopping center down on 32nd Street by Schutzen Park. Okay, But again, 100 years ago, this is, this is the Six Flags, right? This is, this is Disneyland, okay? And it was sitting right down here, a few miles away. Now, there's a lot of stats on this, and I want, I want to make sure I get them right. So this is the entrance to the park, okay? Again, if you can see... It says Union Hill. And again, because nobody knows where North Bergen is, right? Nobody understands what North Bergen is. Again, everybody in this room has probably gone through this where you, somebody says, where are you from? And you go, North Bergen. And they go, oh, like Dumont? No, no, North Bergen. Oh, Demers, right? They just start naming random North Bergen County towns, right? So again, it makes sense here. So Columbia Park starts operating in 1919. Okay, it really, after after World War I, Americans are feeling really good. Okay, we're sitting on top of the world. Uh, the park itself will operate up until the 1930s. Now, yes, it, there were pieces of it, remnants of it. Every time I do this, someone goes, well, I went I used, uh, roller skating there in the 50s. Yeah, yeah, the roller skating rink was there, right? There were pieces of the venue that were left. But the park ceased to exist in, in this, what we're going to see in the 1930s, okay? Now, the park is a major draw for the town. Wealthy, poor, local, out-of-towners, everybody's going to Columbia Park. They've got something for everybody, okay? And this was an oasis, all right, for the people in this area. Now, we had another entrance. And again, I always find it so funny, like especially with Columbia Park, the things they chose to put. This is the automotive entrance, right? Like, I mean, I don't know who goes on vacation and they're like, I want to show where I parked my car, right? But again, they had the ability uh, for to for you to park your car at this place. And again, that's a huge deal because, well, now folks from New York know they could drive over, right? Folks from Upper Bergen County know they can drive over, okay? Now, we'll take a look more. There's a lot happening here. In this card, we have the bandstand off to the left the free act stage up here in the front, the big dipper in the back, which is that huge uh, roller coaster and the arrow swings in the background. Okay, they had something for everybody. Now, when we looked into this, the big dipper 
right? As it's called, is a very popular style of roller coaster uh, from this era in U.S. history. Uh, in fact, um, according to the, the newspaper reports, on average, the dipper would take about six weeks to complete. Okay, and again, this is wood construction, right? This is, so that's pretty good, right? I mean, the turnaround there. And it would cost roughly $50,000. And we're talking like 1920, right? That's a lot of money, okay? Uh, the creator is a guy by the name of Arthur Loft. Uh, and he created the Giant Dipper, okay? Which is out in Santa Cruz, California, still in operation today. Okay, so if you're ever out in Santa Cruz, you could get a glimpse at what something from Little Coney Island looked like. Okay, and actually give it a ride. Uh, so that's pretty cool. All right, so we have that over there. Next, we have just this one, the Columbia Park Union Hill, it says. Um, this is what I always think is really funny. The Dodgem, right, uh, is on here. And you got to remember, here we are in, you know, 1920, 1921. Not everybody's got a car, right? So the Dodgem was used to teach people how to drive a car and avoid getting into accidents, which ironically evolves into bumper cars, which is where people go and get whiplash now. So it's funny just how amusements will kind of evolve. Now, the park itself, and again, it's huge, right? It's huge. It's 50 acres, right? That's a lot of property. Okay, so we have a 50-acre park. We have the Big Dipper, right? Also, the roller coaster here in front is called the Greyhound. It was a smaller roller coaster, and it was faster. Okay, again, wood construction. Uh, it was known for its speed, right? And that's what the big draw was. So it's a pretty cool look into the park. Then we have the dance pavilion, the restaurant, bowling alley, and a garden. All that is there, okay? Now... The operator of the park is a guy by the name of Otto Asherbach, right? And he dubbed the park the Fairyland of New Jersey, all right? So he wanted to make sure there was something for everybody here. Uh, he even claimed at one point that the dance pavilion is the largest in the entire state, right? He's going to claim a lot about this park, all right, especially when we get into the pool, all right? But again, aside from the entertainment, uh, the place also had a pony track. It had ski ball, um, yes the iconic New Jersey sport of skee-ball. They added here first, all right? Uh, they had a Japanese tea room and uh, an arcade, all right? All set up at that early 20th century. Now, we get another bird's eye view, and this image kind of was worn out when we received it, but it's going to give us a couple of different ideas here. There is a Ferris wheel there, okay? We are going to have a castle inside of this park, and I'm not. this is not a made-up wooden castle this is a brick and mortar castle that was in this amusement park and there's we'll get to why that's there in a minute but we have this great image of it from the above there we then also get the images from the inside of the boardwalk near the frolic now with all our research we know we have no idea what that is we cannot find any information on this thing and we are we've looked at maps newspaper archives there's no reference to a frolic except for this. Um, what the consensus was a couple of years ago was that the frolic is just another name for the boardwalk. Because uh, what do you do on a boardwalk? You, you frolic, right? Um, at least I do. All right. They had the Noah's Ark, which we'll talk about in a minute, the old and the old mill. Okay. Now, let's talk about this castle. This is the, the Yi Castle as many people will refer to it, right? Now, the castle itself predates the park, okay? The castle was built in 1840. Now, the castle was originally built there by a man by the name of William Cantello. So if anybody's from the Union City area, especially down by like where 495 is, you'll know there's a Cantello street there. So the legend goes... Okay, and I had to reach out to the Union City guys for this, so I'm gonna take it with a grain of salt, all right? But the rumor is that Cantello was a British Lord and he fell in love with a girl, as it happens, and the family disapproved of it. So he and the girl ran off to America and he built a castle for them in beautiful North Bergen, New Jersey, all right? 
very romantic. I told my wife that once and she's like, no. Um, all right, but the castle after Cantello left, it served the park as a restaurant, okay? It served as a restaurant and a dance hall. So again, unfortunately, when the park starts to be dismantled in the 30s, so is the castle, right? And there's no remnants of it uh, anywhere. It's probably used as somebody's a wall in somebody's backyard, but I digress. All right. We also have Noah's Ark. So believe it or not, it, it was here. All right. This is where Noah landed, if you prescribe for that uh, belief, right? All right. Noah landed in North Bergen. All right. But the Ark was a zoo, right? It was a zoo. All right. And it's one of their more famous attractions. And what they had inside were both domesticated and wild animals. And yes, they were in pairs, okay? So again, they kept the theme going. Uh, they also, as you can see in the front here, had an elephant, a paper mache elephant, but they still had an elephant, all right? We then come to the swimming pool, all right? And this is this is the, the big draw of the park. Again, we can see they're listing it off as Union City, all right? And again, because they're gonna know it. This also dates the card for us a little more too, because Union City is not a town until 1926. So now we have an idea of when this card is from. Now, the pavilions in the back boasted that they could hold up to 6,000 people's uh, belongings on any given day. So anytime you go to this park, you could assume there's up to 6,000 people swimming in that pool, all right? Um, then when we take a look more again, we have the Silver Falls. All right, and then we're not sure what it said underneath there, uh, but what's a pool without a waterfall, you know? So again, the Columbia Park pool has about 6,000 people in it and it holds 1.5 million gallons of water, okay? And it was 250 feet long by 165 feet wide. So this is a huge pool. This is a massive piece of pool. pool. And it's at its depth, the most deep it gets is 12 feet deep. Okay, and again, it is supplied with a fresh water supply uh, that was continuously circulated, all right, by a state-of-the-art filtration system, right? Now, where did they get the water The water from? Everybody was always asked this. Where did they get the water from? They, they got it from the meadows out in Sea Caucus, right? So they would pump that water up and then have it flow in and out of the park. It really was an engineering feat to have this be done, all right? Then we get another image, okay? This is the boulevard showing Schutzen Park, right? So again, you know, when we go down there, you know, the Fritz Reuter building, that, that's a very old building, okay? We're, we're talking a turn of the century building, which has been modified and updated, obviously, but that original structure, that, that's old, all right? That's been there for a very long time. Uh, and again, where does the name come from, right? Who is, who is Fritz Reuter, right? Well, Fritz Reuter, it is a German author. And the folks who immigrated here, uh, he must have been very popular at the time with the immigrants here. So they named the building after him. So just so you know where the name comes from. Again, there is the building itself, right? This is that original structure. It's still there, all right? It is still there. All right, obviously modified and more surrounded, right? Today, there's none of these homes are here anymore. You got the Sears building over here now. Okay, so there is a bit of a difference to the area. What's the uh, this is the uh, 32nd Street in Kennedy Boulevard. So again, we've got all this going on, a lot of changing going on into this area. Then you add in Schutzen Park, they had their own lake, right? And they had their feast halls, right? Which again, these are all being replaced now by the, the bigger casino building that's there. So that is where all these would be. Then they had the entrance to Schutzen Park. Um, and I really like this one. Because when if we could zoom in and clean it up, which is all available on our Facebook page, uh, there's a sign right here that says football, okay, that they would hold sporting events there. And we know that the Academy Athletic Club was playing the Jefferson Athletic Club, and there was an advertisement on there uh, for when they did this. The only problem is we don't know the final score. We're still waiting to find that, um, but we're trying. All right, but again, Totally different entrances to this park today uh, or establishment. Again, here's the lake in the park. All right, again, completely replaced. 
uh, by the casino. Uh, and then some of this is actually the apartments behind it now, the uh, Lincoln Place that's right behind it. So it is a different world uh, in the 20s and teens over there, okay? Here's another castle, all right? The second castle we're talking about today. This one you could still go visit, all right? And stay there forever if you choose, actually. Um, so this is the entrance to Becker's Castle. This wall is still there. You can go to this wall. It's still standing on Kennedy Boulevard directly to the left of Town Hall. This is the crematory that is on Kennedy Boulevard. Originally, it is the home of Lewis Becker. All right, again, a real estate kind of magnet, uh, German immigrant comes to this part of the country and, and settles in there and owns pretty much everything that we know uh, as like Uptown Union City, right? From Park Ave to Kennedy Boulevard, from about 32nd Street to 43rd Street. He owns it all. Um, he also owns everything that will become Palisade Cemetery and Weehawken Cemetery. So he is extremely wealthy. Um, again, we'll take a look. Again, this is the entrance to the driveway that's there now. Obviously, the arch is gone, long gone. But there's that's the only thing that's long gone. Uh, all of the brickwork that is there um, is all bluestone. Now, there's two schools of thought. Uh, one is that it was pulled right from the Palisades. Uh, however, there are reports that say the brick is, uh, the building is actually brick by brick imported from Germany. Um, now, we don't know how true that is. This is like reports from like the 1870s and the 1880s that are claiming that. Uh, and that is at like the height of Becker's, you know, power in this area, right? So we don't know if that was to kind of showcase his wealth or if that was the actual truth. Um, the building design, the blueprints are actually on file at the State Museum. Um, doesn't reference anything about being imported, but there's blueprints on file. So it is interesting. Um, again, we'll go down and building looks a little different today. Okay. Uh, we could see some turrets right here and here, right? Those have been long gone. Okay. But they were originally there in the building. Uh, and again, the Becker family lived there right, until about 1907, um, when it is then sold. So no, the dolphin, as, so, as weird as this sounds, uh, um, I asked about the dolphin because I thought that was extremely weird uh, for a dolphin to be at a crematory. Mm -hmm. Didn't make sense to me in the 40 years of my life that I spent on this earth, why that's there. Um, and they explained that the dolphin was a gift um, from a husband whose wife was interned there uh, sometime in the 60s. So the fountain, yeah, original, right? The dolphin is a new addition. Um, in fact, this whole area, um, after Lewis Becker's death, there's a debate over what should happen to it. Um, much like today with our concerns about like, you know, some people have concerns about all the apartment buildings that are being brought in and things like that. In 1907, they had the same concerns. They were like, you're gonna knock that down and put row houses, like people freaked out. Um, the county at one point was like, we'll buy it and we'll make it a park. And the Becker estate basically said, no, we're not gonna do that. We've got a bigger buyer than the county. The buyer is the New York and New Jersey crematory. Now, it sounds weird, right? But Becker gets involved with funerals, right? Again, he bought, had the territory behind his home, which will become Palisade Cemetery. Uh, he's buried back there. He's, he's, he's back there. Him, his wife, the whole family, they're back there. Um, so it's kind of just the natural progression. Even when he buys that, he puts one of the first um, crematories in the county in that cemetery. So they're cremating people in that cemetery as early as 1890, all right? So this is not like very new. Becker and these folks had some type of understanding, I think, before Becker even dies. So they come in. They don't really change the building much. They take down the turrets and they, you know, over time, they put up some stucco finishing 
However, if you ever go to that building, which you can go, it's open on the weekends if you, know, you got nothing to do and you want to walk around a mausoleum. Um, if you go around the back part of it, the original facade is still showing. So you could go back and get a look. All the stained glass on the inside is all original. All the woodworking on, on all the doors, all original. Uh, it's actually very impressive uh, to see that type of craftsmanship in a building uh, that most people are probably too afraid to even go into. Um, next to town hall? Yeah, right. I mean, there's the old uh, St. Rocco's Bingo Hall, but right next to it, yeah. All right, again, here's another image of the building, again, with its original brick facade. And then an image that everybody knows very well. It's where we pay taxes. All right, um, this is the town hall, all right? Now, the town hall, all right, is probably the most iconic building, I think, in town because it's one of the only original buildings left uh, that hasn't been added with siding or updates or anything like that. Um, architecturally, it's very unique to the town. It's the only type of style of building like it in the town. It's a palazzo-style building. Right, so there's no Italian Renaissance buildings in this town except for this one. Um, it's originally constructed between 1905 and 1908, so that building's been there a long time. It's under the construction is done under Commissioner and future Mayor James Nolan, uh, who is a pretty big deal in town. Um, and again, there was this way to pay off. Uh, the cost of the town hall as well. They figure, how are we going to pay for this thing, right? We we got some tax money that we could use, but how, how do we actually um, pay for this thing? So the top floor, right, actually at one point had two apartments above it, uh, which were able to be rented out. Uh, and I only know that, that that's 100% true. And I get to tell this all the time, and I think it's funny, and people don't believe me when I say this. Uh, I feel like I got to bring them in. But my dad was born on top of town hall, right? Um, my grandparents, well, my great grandfather was the porter for the building, he was the janitor, and he got to live in one of the apartments rent free. Um, my grandparents, young couple, not a lot of money, they lived with them, and my dad was born on top of town hall. So he always asked me, when can he go back? And I told him, I don't think he can. Um, but again, it's an interesting style of art. And again, people lived up there until the 1970s, right? You were able to rent out the top floor of town hall. Uh, the ironic thing is the only way in was, was through the front door. There's no side entrance. There's no other way in. You had to go through the front door. So I must imagine it must have been kind of like interesting, like 11 o'clock at night, just seeing someone go in and out of the building. I just, I don't know. It's just, maybe that's why it was put on that part of the street. But again, here we have town hall. Another image, again, notice the parking that's available on Kennedy Boulevard. Um, yeah, pretty much, right? Again, it's a very colorful card. It, it depicts this, this just era of Kennedy Boulevard in 1890, uh, excuse me, about 1910, we'd assume. Um, the building here on the corner, though, we know that it opens up in about 1895. Um, and it is kind of just this like hotel, restaurant, bar, slash bank. Um, and the way we know it's a bank is because when Town Hall moves there, all the employees cash their checks there, um, which is really weird uh, when we think about just how banking works today. But in like 1910, like you're like, I got paid. Let's go to the bar bank um, and just cash my check. And then people went home. Uh, unfortunately, the building is also torn down sometime in the late 20s. Uh, so it was, you know, now it's a couple of very nice homes, but it doesn't last too long. Another image we get of Town Hall, and this one we could date. Uh, this is sometime around 1920. Uh, and the reason we know that very faintly here, that is the World War I memorial that is still there, which has all the names of the men who died during World War I. Uh, from Northburg. So again, if you're ever in that area, pass by, it's a very cool monument, a uh, very forgotten monument. But again, very interesting look. All right, now this one, still around in some form, a little different today. All right, that's Grove Church. 
All right. And they label it as New Durham, New Jersey. Now, that can be confusing for some of us because we North Bergeners kind of know New Durham as somewhere else. But we know Grove Church. Uh, this is 46th Street and Kennedy Boulevard. All right. Uh, this is where Grove Reformed Church is. Right. Uh, today, it's a different structure uh, because this building, unfortunately, burns down. All right. The original wood structure. Uh, this church, however, almost predates the town itself. Uh, that building was uh, completed in 1847. So again, this postcard is coming from about 1910, give or take. So that building's already stood for nearly 50 years, right, in this location. Uh, it's originally given to the church by the Zabriskie family, very powerful family from Jersey City. Uh, the first reverend is a reverend by the name of William, William Mabon, uh, and he will serve there until he kind of gets a job at Rutgers as a teacher and then kind of moves on. So I think that's always a pretty interesting one. You know, another little image of the church before it was destroyed, okay? Again, it stood there for about 128, 29 years uh, at this point. Uh, in 1883, they had a massive, massive celebration there for Martin Luther's 400th birthday, um, which was reported on as a big deal. Uh, and then again, the church was destroyed in, in 73. Uh, by a massive fire, but they rebuilt three years later. Uh, and still, it's, it's a cornerstone of the community, right? With like generational membership involved in that church. Uh, and they were also very nice to let us tour their cemetery. Um, so they were very nice there. All right. Uh, another place that people are dying to get into. Um, it's my North Bergen Cemetery jokes. All right, I'll stop now. All right. Um, this is Flower Hill Cemetery. Right, that building is still there. It is a hundred and thirty-five years old. That building, okay. It is a Queen Anne cottage. The cemetery itself takes up twelve acres of property. All right, um, and here's something that's just like really bizarre uh, by today's kind of understanding of what cemeteries are. When all of these cemeteries are built, Grove Cemetery, Wee Hawkins Cemetery, Palisade Cemetery, Flower Hill. They're not just cemeteries. They're also serving as botanical gardens. My Flower Hill is a great example of it because if you ever wander around there, you'll notice there's, they really, the paths go in and out and in and out. And there's a lot of trees in Flower Hill and in Hoboken and McFella cemeteries. That was people's escapes, right? It wasn't weird to see like people on a Saturday or a Sunday, like stroll through a cemetery. Right, to get some greenery in their lives. Um, cemetery itself has a lot of interesting uh, graves in there. Uh, one is a mass grave for the 1900 Hoboken Pier fire victims. Uh, three ships went on fire in Hoboken. People were on board and they cut them loose and let them sail down the Hudson River until they ran aground. Um, it was one of the largest maritime disasters in New York and New Jersey history. Um, also in there is Civil War veteran Decatur Dorsey, right? His grave is in there, and it is home to New Jersey's only pyramid grave, all right? The grave of Charles F. Arm. So if you're ever there, don't go now, it's getting late. But if you're ever wandering around, drive in there, there's a pyramid right off to the right as soon as you go in there. A uh, really interesting thing to see. All right, another site that is long gone is this. The old people's home on the boulevard, all right, in North Bergen today. Yep, it is where the Board of Education is. All right, so in this building stood roughly from about 1890 up until about 1960, right, when the school's construction went on. It was a smaller building, right? It did have residents, older residents who could not afford to live on their own um, and was a real service to the town. Uh, privately owned, um, and unfortunately was not kept. They went with the very uh, futuristic design that North Bergen High School is from the 1960s, right? So they got rid of this old classic Georgian revival stuff uh, for the new stuff, all right? We then got another image, and now we're going to get into our hotels. Uh, this is Haas's Point, all right, in North Bergen, which is not too far from here, all right? The Haas family themselves will arrive in North Bergen in about 1860. Um, 
and you know you're a pretty big deal when part of a town gets named after you. Um, now, exactly why and how House Points gets its namesake? Well, the Haas family um, was headed by a German immigrant by the name of Karl Style Haas. Um, and according to them, their property, which is kind of the triangle part of Kennedy Boulevard where it splits, right, down to Kennedy and Bergenwood, that's where they are. That's Haas's point. Um, in 1870, it was worth about $20,000. By today's standards, believe it or not, that only equates to about $400,000, right? So the Haas family got in before anybody else. Uh, and most re people recognize the name because Haas, there was an old mobile dealer there at one point that bore the family's name. So that's one. Uh, the other hotel, not too far up Kennedy Boulevard, is the old Waldorf, all right? And I like the Waldorf because those guys knew how to market, all right? This hotel opens the same year the Waldorf Astoria opens. And they just stole the name, right? Trying to confuse people. Um, it's a really interesting look. Now, again, the inn there had a saloon. Uh, they had the finest spirits of the day. They had an exclusive deal with the, the William Peters Brewery, which was down in Union City. They had fresh beer brought up every day, okay? Um, they had a bowling alley built into the basement. And they had tournaments, all different local societies would get together for sporting tournaments. Um, and again, they had an outdoor spring and summer beer garden. And again, this would be roughly about 9001 Kennedy Boulevard today, where those big brick apartment buildings are and the, the, the car shop is right behind it. That's where this was. All right. Now, this is a, a one that's kind of tucked away. Um, Weatherby Park, which is a name nobody really knows. This, this was even a shocker when we came across this. Um, we didn't think this was actually North Bergen. Um, but Weatherby Park is 76th Street between Kennedy and Bergeline Avenue. It's the neighborhood's original name they would have given it. Um, and again, it comes from the fact that, well, it was named for Weatherby Place because originally the Weatherby family owned the property. And then they decided uh, to lot it and build on it. So it was originally all farms, all right? One of the last uh, remnants of their farming industry that would have been back there was the Honaker's Dairy that used to be back there. So again, Weatherby Place, uh, long gone, Weatherby Park, long gone, but this street you could actually go to. This is 76th and 5th. So if you go over to 76th Street, stand on the corner, look down, all of these homes are still there. Every single one of them, right? And now we'll get into the, the uptown. I put them last because everybody thinks I do too much about uptown. But they took a lot of pictures. I can't, I can't help where they took pictures of. All right. This is just going to be simply, so the Woodcliffe stuff simply just gets labeled with an, a street. That's it. So this is 31st Street in Woodcliffe. Today, we know this as 74th Street and Broadway. Okay, that's the intersection here. This is on the right-hand side of the image. That is the Brazilian restaurant that's there today. Okay, unfortunately, this building is no longer there, but it is still here in town, believe it or not. We'll take a look at it in a second. There's a better image of the restaurant on the corner today. Again, just says 31st and Broadway. Okay, so it's really interesting to see all of these homes as well, all still there on 74th Street. All the original homes are still back there. We'll go to the next image. This is the old Woodcliffe train station, right? So on Broadway, there were original trolley tracks. And the trolleys would have taken you all the way down to West New York into Dewey Place. You would have caught a transfer there. And then you could have gone down Broadway again or transferred over to Burry Line Avenue. Uh, both of those lines ended up on about 22nd Street in Union City. Uh, and then you could have got a transfer there to go on to Hoboken or Jersey City. Um, this building stood there for about 40 years. Uh, there was threats to tear it down. And someone had the bright idea to save it. And they moved it. And they moved it around the street. So this house is on... The, it's just tucked away sideways on 73rd Street right off of Boulevard East, right? So if you're ever walking on 73rd Street, on the right-hand side, the house is turned sideways. So you actually see these windows. 
move the entire house, which sounds crazy, but like there was a family in this town, the Ashaw family, that was their job. They were house movers. They owned a lumber mill and all that stuff, but one of their big jobs was moving homes, right? It must have just been easier to move your house than to build a new one, right? Which by looking at our streets today and seeing how tight they are, if you couldn't even think about it. But remember, we're talking 100 years ago where there's nobody around, right? So again, this building, if you really want to see it, it's still there. Don't knock on their door. Um, we'll take a look at it. All right. And then again, listen, 31st Street looking towards Birdland. I don't know what it was about this street, but they took a lot of pictures of this intersection. Um, knowing the history of Woodcliffe, like, I mean, every intersection there had a lot going on. But for some reason, 31st Street got documented completely. Everything in this image is still sort of kind of here. Okay. And I say that because this apartment complex is still there on the left hand side. The homes that are lining 31st Street, they're all still there. This building, however, is the kind of sort of still there building. This is, well, we'll go to the next one, the Haplin block. Okay. Today, this building is shifted over a bit. Okay, and here's what we're talking about. This building, all right? Today, if you go on Broadway and go on to 74th Street, this center section is still standing there, right? Actually, from here over is still standing there. The Haplin block was built by George Haplin, all right? And it was rented out and all this stuff uh, until Woodcliffe really got to be a bigger town, we'll call it. Uh, and once it got too big, they needed more amenities. So Haplin sold off a portion of his building and built, and the Woodcliffe Trust Company was built. Uh, that bank still stands on 74th Street today, but you can notice the Haplin buildings are still there, right? So again, even as we're looking at this, right, we're looking at 1910, and then by like 1920, it's completely gone. Right. So even this area of Woodcliffe is seeing rapid development. And that's kind of maybe why they're taking so many pictures of it. But it's pretty interesting to see. Uh, the Woodcliffe um, banking system uh, was really run by an interesting character. Um, let me see. Where's my notes here? I don't want to get his name wrong. Somebody get mad. Um, do, 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 I lost my place. Don't worry about it. We'll get to him in a second because we see his, we're going to see his house. Um, but again, the Woodcliffe banking system is done because, well, and I don't want to give too much away because next month we'll start our walking tours, weather permitting, uh, and we're going to go through the history of Woodcliffe. Um, but they don't want to be part of town. They want to leave, right? So that's why they start adding amenities and things like that in uh, to kind of draft up why they don't want to be here anymore. All right, but we'll go down that road uh, next time. All right, here is... Uh, 30th Street, right? So 74th Street, a little further up. Those homes are still there, right? Again, these are model homes. So you were able to go around different parts of the town. And again, this is so bizarre to think about this town in this way. But 100 years ago, you had like one house per street and it was a model home. And you went in and you were like, oh, I like this, but I don't like that. And then they would custom build your house, right? So again, this is really different from like kind of what we see today. And again, I like to point out that, hey man, these houses were at one time, one of a kind, right? These were unique, oh, each custom homes, all right? Again, 32nd Street, right? So now we're going further up. Now we're on 76th Street, right? The old trick is this. If you see the old numbered streets, add 44 to it. And that'll tell you what street you're on, okay? Now we're on 74th Street. Again, those homes are still there, right? Those homes are still at that intersection. Again, same thing here. The other direction, going towards Boulevard East, both of those homes are still at the intersection, right? So even though we saw a bunch of stuff that has changed, some parts of towns, have, they kind of stayed the same, right? Again, another one, 33rd. So now we're on 77th Street and Broadway, okay? Those homes are both still there, okay? Very good to see. And then another extremely iconic building, all right, here on 34th Street. So now we're on 78th Street in Broadway, right? This building is still here, right, off to the right. Um, from what we can find, 
that building was built in 1893. Um, and it's been on that corner for about 130 years at this point. Um, who it was built for, we still do not know. All right, we cannot find the name of the original owner, uh, but I am desperately still trying to find that. I think it's interesting to know who it is, uh, especially because 78th Street, when the homes were built, that was referred to the castle neighborhood, where if you ever take a walk on 78th Street, especially between Broadway and Park, those are some of the biggest homes in this town, right? So those homes were all at one point referred to as castles, right? Which I think is really interesting. Um, now, with all these people living there, they, there's kids, and kids have to go somewhere, right? This is public school number two, all right? This is the original Robert Fulton School, okay? Now, this is, again, this town's growing. We have schools in all over the town. I don't want it to be like, oh, well, school number two is the second school built. No, no, no. The school districts went down in number. So school district number one, the school actually was in Hudson County Park. It was a school called um, Grant School, right? So Grant School was in the park. And then Wood, uh, Robert Fulton is number two, Horace Mann's number three, right? So on and so on and so forth until you got down to Jefferson School, which was like number 10 school, right? Which is today Kennedy School, all right? So you have these schools here. Now, this building, okay? Fine, great school building. But North Burton grew, more kids showed up. We had to build a new school. Right. So they knocked this building down and built new Robert Fulton School, the school that's still there to this day. In 1920, when that school was built, it cost a total of six hundred seventy one thousand dollars to build that building. OK, today, that would be about nine point eight million dollars to build that building. And every time and I think this is pretty funny, every time we built a school in this town, the town almost goes bankrupt every school we build, right? Uh, in fact, one of the schools that is a great example of this uh, is McKinley School. So McKinley School is the school right next to 495 when you're coming up the turnpike. That building is half complete, right? If you ever walked into that building, the building just stops and it's just a brick wall across the entire back. It's only half a school. They ran out of money when they were building it. And they looked at it and went, this is good. <laughs> It'll be okay. Um, so I think that's just really interesting. All right. In Woodcliffe, we also have this, um, again, a site that is long gone. Okay. This is, again, just labeled off as 31st Street, Hudson Ave in Woodcliffe. This is the old Reformed Church. This was replaced by Temple Bethel. Okay, so that is the corner directly across from Robert Fulton. All right. Now, again, there's a really great story um, that comes from this church, right? There was a Baptist congregation that, that lived in this church or worked out of this church, and they didn't have enough money to buy a piano when the church was constructed. So every Sunday, they would bring a piano from someone's house and roll it down the hill and then roll it back up when they were done. So I think that's a pretty cool story, a uh, pretty interesting story. And again, we get this image, and I love this because this really shows just the development of that part of town, right? And you could see all these, and again, all these homes that are in the background, they're all still there for the most part, right? Those apartment buildings in the background of the picture, those are right by Hudson County Park still, right? Those are all those beautiful old pre-war buildings that are there. So again, as much as things change, they stay the same, right? Speaking of staying the same, right? Here's the old Woodcliffe Engine Company, right? Which today is still there, uh, part of the North Hudson Regional Fire Department. So you can still walk by there. Again, this building goes back to about 1900, right? So it's again, one of the original firehouses in the area. Now we go into kind of these scenic views that they tried to give, right? Uh, here we have the cliff from the boulevard, right? Woodcliff on Hudson. All right, this is roughly showing uh, where 74th Street comes around the bend there on Boulevard East. So this is actually, if you were looking and trying to find a spot there, you'd have to stand in Guttenberg to go to that view. Uh, so you'd also probably stand on somebody's front porch. But 
Today, there's apartments over here, but that is where you're looking at, the bend on 74th Street. Again, there it is again, across from Guttenberg, and you're looking at the bend. Now, again, we've been over here before. Some of you joined me for the walking tours. This is where the Battle of Bulls Ferry would have taken place, right? So again, there is a reason why they're showing it. Most people look at it and go, who cares about the Palisades, right? They're showing it because a major historical event happens there. They're also showing it because this is an advertisement for you to come and invest into Woodcliff, right? And again, here's the mighty Palisades standing at 300 feet, right? And when we do the tours on the boulevard, I always point out, like, hey, we're walking on a series of bridges here, right? That we are not on flat ground, right? That there's a series of bridges. Now, to know where we are today, Walgreens is right down here, right? Which is a weird landmark considering what we're looking at. But again, there's a Walgreens there now, all right? Again, Palisades are a big draw, right? We get another postcard, right? Edited and colored and, and you know, nice piece of artwork showcasing uh, the bridge work that goes on over the Palisades. And then here we have another advertisement for Woodcliffe. It just says Boulevard, right? On it's Boulevard East, because at this point, remember, there is no Boulevard East, right? John F. Kennedy doesn't exist yet at this point, right? So there's nothing named after him. It's just Boulevard, right? Um, on our Facebook page, if you want, when you get home to blow it up, there's actually a gigantic sign back here that says Woodcliffe. We had our own Hollywood sign that said Woodcliffe at one point. Giant white letters that were cut out, all right? An advertisement to the friendly New Yorkers across the river uh, to come over and take a shot at uh, investing here. Uh, another view most of us have never seen before, shipping industry on the Hudson River, right? Long gone, probably not coming back, all right? But this was a site that you'd see up and down the coastline here, North Bergen, West New York, down into Weehawken, right? That was all that was here. So again, real kind of glimpse into the past there. All right. Now we're at this, and this is one of my favorite ones. All right, so this is the, the old mansion, over a hundred years old. All right. Now, who lives there? I'll just get his name here, where is he? All right. We are looking at the home. Um, oh my God, I don't have his name here. Now I feel like a knucklehead. Um, I apologize, I'm not prepared today. Um, but we are looking at the home, and I know I'm going to remember this as soon as I get in my car to go home. Um, but they are a banking magnet, right? They are responsible for the creation of Woodcliffe, all right, the owner of this home. Um, but he's kind of like a ruthless businessman and will buy out anybody, right, in any way he can. So his home is a big deal. It's such a big deal that when his home burns down, that they make a postcard out of it. <laughs> Interesting. Um, pretty much. Um, all right. So when we go in, now we'll, we'll jump back downtown again. And, and this is a pretty interesting thing. So we tried to go, what I tried to do is go up Kennedy Boulevard until I couldn't go anymore. Now we'll jump back. Um, this is the new Durham section part of town we're going to look at. All right. This is the old McCullum Homestead in North, uh, New Durham, right? Um, it is situated around six corners. Okay. So we're kind of in that neighborhood today. Um, the place is very interesting. It's part of the McCullum Homestead. Uh, it's owned and operated by a guy by the name of Cornelius McCullum. Uh, he lives there with his family and he rubs elbows with everybody. He is friends with Cornelius Vanderbilt. The, yeah, like this, this is a big deal. Um, he is friends with congressmen. He's friends with all these railroad guys um, because they're all passing through right by his home, right? So he knows everybody. He's rubbing elbows with all of these guys. Um, unfortunately, the building is long gone, right? Uh, also, if you get a chance to zoom in on this image, uh, this is an A and P delivery truck, believe it or not. Um, so it's pretty interesting. All right. Another site that most residents know is the First Baptist Church down there on Tunnelly Avenue. All right. Again, very old, older than the town. They come to this town in 1837. 
right? And they will occupy that corner from 1837 till today. Um, Church House has not changed much. There it is in 1937, celebrating its 100th anniversary, all right? Both of those buildings are still there today. You can still go down there. That's right next to the post office down on 40 uh, Church Street, 42nd Street. Like another site that's long gone is the old FR Austin Lumber Mill. All right, this would have been on 40th and Grand Avenue. Um, the mill and the building was taken down in the 40s. However, the Austin brothers took their business down to Florida and they're still in operation, all right, which is pretty cool to see. Uh, this one is the old post office that was in New Durham. Um, and the late, great uh, Ronnie Skokanish, this this was his favorite thing to talk about. Um, so this post office was built roughly around 1845, the first time mail starts coming to this town. And it is operated by a guy by the name of Henry Ackerson. He's the first postmaster of North Bergen. So he's there and, and he's in operation there for a very long time. By 1900, um, a woman or a husband takes over, Abraham Kittle. Now, Abraham passes away and the job goes to his wife, Caroline, to which most research points to she's the first female postmaster in the United States. Um, and she is also credited with creating something that you get today when you go to the post office, a return receipt, mm -hmm. right? So she's the first person that the Postal Service says issued that. So that's another first for this town, right? That we are blessed to have somebody that was smart enough to be like, yes, here's your receipt that you actually sent this, right? So it's pretty interesting. All right. Now jumping all over the map now. Now we're going back to the park, all right? Here we have 79th and Bergline Avenue, or as it was originally called, Parkway, 35th Street Parkway, all right? Uh, and again, not much has changed. I mean, on this side of the street, right? All of the homes are still there, right? Apartment building is still there. The park is a little different. We've added bluestone walls, right? Those get added during the Great Depression, right? Those are WPA projects, right? To, to beautify the park, all right? Again, here's the entrance to the park. Um, something I often have arguments about with people that the entrance on Boulevard East is from the Revolutionary War it is not. It is built in 1918 under the direction of Charles Lowry. All right. And he had envisioned, and, and this is something really unique because most of us use Bergenline Avenue as the entrance to the park. He envisioned that Boulevard East would be the entrance to the park that anybody that visited would enter from that side of the park and that Bergline would be the exit. So it's interesting to know that because now if you ever go through the park from Boulevard East, the park actually makes a lot more sense going in that way versus going in from Bergline Avenue, right? So next time you take a walk, try coming in from that side and coming out, it's gonna flow a lot nicer. Uh, another iconic site, right? Originally, this was a fountain in the middle. All right, and then the gateway, the entranceway, that was originally part of the Hudson County Police Department, right? So it was a rest house, had bathrooms, uh, but it also had a police precinct in it, all right, where the police officers would operate out of protecting the park. Uh, again, another interesting image of it. And again, if you go to the TD Bank down here on, Berg on Kennedy Boulevard, uh, this image is actually in there. Uh, and that is a police officer standing there, right, taking his you know, being proud of his operation. And again, notice the bluestone around here, right? A lot of these flower pots, unfortunately, are gone uh, just through time, right? Um, but again, real interesting to see the park in that fashion. Again, here's the circle right above the lake, right? Very interesting look. And then we get into kind of a little further north of here, right? We get into Little Coney Island, right? Another amusement park that was here. Um, what we have here are a couple of rides. We have a ride called the Tickler. Um, interesting name, all right? Little Coney Island, and we have Dole's Carousel. So the Tickler was an interesting ride. Uh, you and your friends would sit in a you know a car, and the car would spin, and then it would bounce back and around and around and around, and you'd get off real dizzy. Um, Frederick Dole was operating there. He was a carousel maker. Uh, he had one of his carousels there, and he would make carousels and ship them around the country right here from North Bergen. 
Uh, this today is the north entrance to the park across from White Castle. So it's really interesting to see that. Here we have an inside view of the park. Again, here's Dole's carousels, right? Here is the Ferris wheel that was here, which was deemed too dangerous for operation in actual Coney Island. So they brought it over here. Uh, we also have Abraham Dormer's ice cream here. And I always like to point this out. I think this is a great piece of history because every town tries to claim this, but we have the receipts. Um, this is where the waffle cone is created. Okay, so Abe Dormer went to the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1893. Uh, excuse me, the Columbian World Fair, sorry, 1893. And he happened to be at the right place at the right time. So he stood there and watched the guy serve ice cream. And he stood there and watched the guy serve waffles. And the guy serving ice cream ran out of plates. So he stood there and looked at the ice cream and looked at the waffles, bought a waffle, put the ice cream on it. And he's like, I'm going to be a millionaire right now. <laughs> and he took this idea back to North Bergen when he came home and built a machine to press waffles into a cone form. All right. And he served his waffle cone in Little Coney Island. His family still serves these waffle cones down in Norfolk, Virginia. Right. They have his original press machine, which you could still go and get one from. Um, so that's pretty interesting. All right, and then you have another view of the northern end of the kind of music park. This is a later one. This is about 1910, 1911. Uh, the park kind of dies at this point. There's a lot of corruption and, and stuff that goes on there. But this is the old Dungesser Hotel. We have Abe Dor uh, excuse me, Fred Dole's uh, carousel there. And again, the park is starting to just change at this point. Um, here we have the Dungesser Hotel itself again. Right, this is a very common image that we see of it. And again, I always point out the Nungessers, they were there for a long time, right? They, they came over here in the 1870s, right? And built a business where there was nothing. They built a community where there was nothing. Uh, and they were really the centerpiece of just this whole growth of the Hudson Heights neighborhood. Uh, it's, all, it's all due to that uh, and their business there. So it's a really interesting piece. Uh, you also had some floral business, and you had floral businesses all over this town. Uh, Your William Ruthjin's floral establishment, uh, which would have been on Bulls Ferry Road, which is Woodcliffe Ave now, um, near Burger Line in Hudson Heights. And this was common to see. Um, we sent more flowers from North Bergen to New York City than anybody else, right, down to the flower markets. They, they all were grown here. Uh, and then shipped over daily. So it's a really interesting piece of history. Uh, then you got this one, which I think is just kind of funny. Uh, it advertises Heindel's Pine Lawn. Uh, the home is owned by the Heindel family. Uh, a guy by the name of Sixtus Pindel owns this home. Uh, he's a dressmaker. But this home is across the street from Little Coney Island. So he's like, I got this property. I got all these people here. How can I make some money off of them? And he's like, oh, I got pine trees on my property. And he would charge people to walk around his, his front lawn and breathe in the fresh pine air. I don't know. All right, this, this, this is a sucker born every minute, they say. Six just found them all. Um, but again, it's just an interesting way. It goes into kind of showing the Hudson County kind of mentality of I could find a way to make money I'm going to make money right um and I will come to an end here this is the old Hudson Heights hotel all right the Riverview motel hotel excuse me uh this is over where Rancho Mateo is today uh where the gas station is over on the side of the park over there and then this uh building is still there this is over on Palisade Plaza it was originally a post office and a drugstore and it was remained the kind of drugstore up until the, the late 90s that it was in operation. Um, so that's going to be all we got for today. All right. Thanks for hanging out with me tonight. That was a lot to look at. It was a lot. All right. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll gladly take them. We have questions about the cards or anything that we talked about tonight. This one is on Palisades Plaza. Dead center of Palisades Plaza. So if you go north of the park, uh, it's you'll run right into it by the entrance where the baseball fields are in between the two baseball fields. So just cut straight across there and 
right there in front of you. Yeah, the building hasn't changed drastically that much. So you, you'll notice it if you walk down the street. Oh, Flower Hill Cemetery. Oh, it's a little bit of everybody. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a little bit of everybody. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go through there, it is weird uh, because it is, I don't want to say segregated. I don't want to say it's a segregated cemetery. But you walk in and you could clearly see that's that's the German part of the cemetery. And then you could clearly see, oh, that's the Italian part of the cemetery. And that's the these people part of the cemetery. It's really not until you get down towards the bottom where it's kind of a little bit of everybody. Um, now, yeah, it might have to do with churches. It might have to do with just, it, it could just be simply the changing demographics of the town as well. We do go from a predominantly Dutch and German base, then it switches over to the Irish, then it switches to the Italians, and so on and so on and so forth. So it could just be hey, like, they were here first and they died first, so they're closer to Kennedy Boulevard. Like, it was much easier to do it that way. Um, could be that. Flower Hill, oh yeah, absolutely. You can still go in there, you can still wander around. Uh, as creepy as this sounds, like, the part by the boulevard is the most entertaining part, I guess. Uh, you have a lot of old mausoleums that are there, and they're really ornate, and you're not going to get stuff like that in modern cemeteries. Um, but that it's a really interesting place to kind of go walk around and, and see what's going on there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, that, yeah, that's on, bro, well, that's on Anderson Avenue. So this is completely on like a side street, uh, really served just the neighborhood back there. Uh, but no, not, no, not, it, I think it was originally at last, I mean, when I was a kid, it was called like, I think it was just called Palisades Plaza. Uh, I don't think it had any name. I think it was just, yeah, it's the, yeah, it's just still called the Palisades Plaza. So that's, that's where that would be today. You, um, okay. You know, it's a good question, right? And I think the thing is this, and this is honestly just like the tip of the iceberg. So if you ever get a chance to go down to the Hoboken Museum, they have a massive, absolutely massive collection of postcards from around Hudson County. And there are images they have that are just of like random things. Like there were some from West New York that was like golf place. And golf place is the size of this room, right? It's a dead end street. Like three people know where it is. My mother's from West New York. She's, she has no idea where I'm talking about, right? So it's just a dead end street. And they had a picture of it, right? There was just a postcard of it. I think the reason they have so many is, well, it was a way to make some money. So you took pictures and you turned them into a postcard and you bought probably the cheapest one to send somewhere. Most of the postcards that we have in the collection, right, whether it's physical or digital, it has just like random information on the back. It's like, great weather, see you soon. And like, that's it. Again, like most of us today, where you, you go get a postcard, you kind of pick one out that's just generally there and then you don't write anything on it. You just take it home and give it to somebody. People were sending this just to send a brief message. So they're not very expensive. And I don't want everybody to think like these were, you know, five, 10 bucks, right? In the turn of the they were probably a nickel, right? They're, they're, and they, the postage is paid for them on, already at, back in the day. So I think there's just random places because everybody tried to make some money off of where they live. Anybody with a camera, exactly, exactly. Yep. How bad we make a buck? Uh, I might have to start. Um, any any other questions? Anything else? You guys have been great. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us online. Thanks for joining us in person. Uh, hope to see you guys at the next one. Uh, as I make everybody start walking around again. Yeah. <laughs>